we did this course uh, online. This We were planning on doing this in person, and then the pandemic hit. And so this was one of the first courses that we recorded. And uh, I went back and watched some of it. And if you watched it, God bless you, it's awful. Um, just <laughs> me trying to interact with that robo camera in the back of the wall is, is not pleasant. Because um, I, I realize how much of my, like, teaching style is based on interaction and feedback. So you guys have to interact and give me feedback or else I'm going to be really boring. Um, but uh, this is obviously, it's a topic that I can get really nerdy about and I can go on for hours. So I'm going to try to be concise. And, uh, but if I start going too fast, let me know. Interject anytime you have questions. Uh, some of the stuff we're going to cover is pretty nerdy and pretty philosophical. And, but it's, none of it's like incomprehensible and uh, it may just be ways that we haven't thought about it before. So ask questions, um, and uh, I want to make sure that we're all kind of carried along together. Um, real quick, just I want to take like a quick poll of the room, and there's no right or wrong answer here. I'm just kind of curious about like our different backgrounds. So obviously we all know what the worship um, is like at Buck Run, um, but... I know a lot of us come from different churches. So I want you to think of like the church that you, let's call it the church you grew up in. If you grew up in church, some of you may not have. But if you grew up in church, um, think about the church you grew up in and raise your hand if you would describe it as traditional. Okay. I don't think there's anyone left, but raise your hand if you would describe it as contemporary. Okay, so all of us come from a pretty traditional, uh, anyone non-Southern Baptist background? Okay, good, 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 good. Can I, do you mind sharing what your background may be? Frozen and chosen. <laughs> Frozen chosen. <laughs> Lutheran, Presbyterian. Way back in the day, it was Church of Christ. Church of Christ, cool. Nazarene. Nazarene. Good deal. Um, We'll, we're not going to get a whole lot into like the differences between styles today. This is just kind of helpful for me to see like where everyone's coming from. And to give you just a little bit of my personal background, um, I grew up as the son of a Southern Baptist pastor. Uh, he's still he's still preaching. He's in South Louisville today um, for I think he's coming up on 50 years in ministry. Uh, but uh, I haven't always gone to a Southern Baptist church. So there was a period after college where I went to um, a couple different things. I was in a uh, Assembly of God church for a year, so went and got charismatic for a little bit. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so, and, and the Southern Baptist churches I have been a part of haven't all been the same. Uh, the church that I met my wife at, Angeline, um, she was a, grew up in Faith Baptist Church in Laurel, Maryland, which is a suburb of Baltimore. It's kind of like right between Baltimore and D.C. And uh, if you've ever been out in that part of the country, you know that there's just a huge uh, immigrate, immigrant population in that part of the country. You, know, you come to America and you just think, well, let's start at D.C. and see what happens. Um, and so when we, I think by the time that we left uh, Faith Baptist to move to Louisville to pursue our degrees at Boyce. Uh, her church, our church, was about probably only about 15% white, and uh, it's not one that you you wouldn't have have pegged it as like an African American church, uh, just because culturally it didn't have that feel. It wasn't the same, uh, but it was mostly um, African. Uh, immigrants from the African continent that made up our church. And so that body of worship, that style of worship was obviously very different. And our worship leader was from India. So it was um, doctrinally all very much the same as what we believe here at Buck Run. Um, but the way that, it, that the worship came together, the way the services were planned and orchestrated looked very, very different. And what I want us to kind of talk about and look at over the arch of this, uh, it's five weeks. Normally they're six weeks, but we got postponed, so we're going to cram this into five weeks, is that um, there is no right or wrong style of worship. Um, 
there is just right and wrong applications and uh, learning the difference between um, being shaped by culture and letting culture dictate how you worship versus being shaped by scripture and tailored for culture. And it's, it seems really similar, but there is big major implications in the difference between those two. So that's one of the things that we'll talk about. That's why I kind of wanted to see where we're coming from. I would imagine the church that I grew up in is very similar to the church that a lot of you grew up in. Um, it was, uh, for the majority of my life, it was organ on one side of the stage, piano on the other side of the stage. Um, my dad was the only pastor on staff, so our secretary got up and just said, open your hymnals to hymn number 475, and then she would get us started and then back away from the mic, and the congregation would just sing with the organ and piano. And uh, I loved it, even as a kid. I just, you know, I've always been drawn to good songwriting, and our Baptist hymnal, thankfully, is full of really good songwriting. Um, and then eventually we got, uh, you know, a couple hippies moved in, so we got the, uh, the, the two acoustic guitars on stage, and uh, that didn't really change a whole lot, like, content-wise, but it changed kind of the feel. And then, you know, I sort of get roped into, like, the, the high school rock bands and stuff, so I become, like, the contemporary guy at some point. So I've been leading worship for... Uh, in this one way or another for, uh, gosh, about 20 years. And uh, not all of it, most of it not looking like it looks like here on Sunday morning. Most of it actually being pretty awful. Because <laughs> you're growing and you're learning in your instrument and you're, you know, th there was some early 2000s where worship culture wasn't quite as well-defined as it is now. Um, so that's kind of my background. That's where I come from. That's how we got here. And I think it's important that we uh, keep our backgrounds in our minds and, and remember that that, that it does shape us for better or for worse. And it's not something we need to be afraid of uh, or even embarrassed about. I used to be embarrassed about like the kinds of songs I used to lead in worship. You know, like I used to think like, man, Lord, I lift your name on high. It's such a lame song. Like there's nothing to it. And you know, like people would, people would like totally like roll their eyes if I let it say, and that's just not true. Like there was, there was a, like a section of my life where I was leading worship for like 16 year olds where the 16 year olds would have thought that was lame, but it's not a lame song. It's a beautiful song. It's, a, it's just straight from the Psalms. Um, so everywhere you go, there will be different pockets of people who are repulsed by different kinds of worship music strictly based on their past experiences, uh, their preferences, usually not anything doctrinally sound. Um, and what I hope that will come away from this is uh, less, uh, not so much of a firm grip on like this is the only right way and more of a uh, appreciation for how God works among us in different cultures at different times and how in spite of our best efforts, God is glorified. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the best that we can do is still filthy rags. Uh, and that hasn't changed. And God is glorified in our pursuit and in our effort. Um, so whatever cheesy song, you know, if you, like, if you like to like jump up and down to Days of Elijah, you know what I mean? Like jump up and down to Days of Elijah. I mean, we're not going to do it here, but... In the comfort of your own home, knock yourself out. Like, it's fine. Um, so, let's get started. Uh, that's a little bit of my background. So, let's talk about theology of worship. Why do we need theology of worship? Um, our, our study of worship is important for a lot of reasons. Um, Buck Run is a church that thinks deeply and thinks well on a lot of things. And that's something I really appreciate about our church. You know, there are other classes going on right now that are, in terms of doctrine, in terms of significance to our faith, are really important. Um, you chose the most important one, so thank you. <laughs> but uh, there's really, we just think deeply about really core stuff here, and I appreciate that. And worship is no exception. We need to have a well-formed theology of worship. Uh, number one is to worship God as God designed worship. 
Uh, Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, there are so many opportunities for our worship to be conformed to this world. Um, it sells really well to conform worship to the world. It's a, it's a huge moneymaker. Uh, and so it's tempting for everyone. Um, it, in a lot of places, the worship service is uh, planned and orchestrated in such a way with the intent of filling seats. And that cannot be our goal. We have to worship God as God designed worship. Secondly, to engage in a fuller walk with Christ. Psalm 30, 11 through 12. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing, and you have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Only worship of the true and living God can loose our sackcloth, can turn our mourning into dancing. When we encounter unimaginable suffering, uh, there is no substitute for uh, falling down on our knees and, and worshiping God. And that doesn't mean, uh, this is, comes back to kind of opening up our minds a little bit to what worship means. That doesn't mean like just singing 10,000 reasons when we're suffering. It means lamenting. You know, the Psalms are full of prayers of lament, and that's still worship. And so we can fall on our knees before God and say, how long, O Lord? And we can pray like David with just desperation and sackcloth and ashes. And that uh, is freeing, and God hears that. He receives that. Um, so that's all part of engaging in our walk with Christ in a fuller way. Um, third, to defend against bad habits. Exodus 32, 7 through 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Um. Satan would love to corrupt us, would love to thwart us, uh, and um, worship has historically been, um, if it's not well guarded with a good theology of worship, it is a place where we can be vulnerable to being corrupted. Um, and we'll talk later about why we associate worship most with music, um, which isn't necessarily the, the right way to think about it. Um, but when we engage in worship, especially in our modern context, it is an emotional and vulnerable thing. And when we get that emotional, when we get that vulnerable, um, Satan would love to sneak in just the tiniest little inaccuracies, the slightest little things that can then kind of steamroll into bigger implications. So um, we have a good theology of worship to defend us against... Um, bad habits against things that we do just for the sake of doing them, um, stuff like that. So, and lastly, kind of tied in with this to defend against bad theology. Uh, Ephesians 4, 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Um, so like I said, this is... Um, Worship can be the spot where if we let our guard down, we can be tricked, we can be conned into believing something about God that isn't true. Um, I, I don't, I'm going to just tell you this up front, and this is not a judgment on anyone who does, I don't listen to Christian radio, like ever, and that's not a judgment on anyone who does. It's totally fine if you do. I just personally, stylistically, it's not my thing. Um, so every now and then I have to get on like Spotify and just search for like, I just want to see like, is there any like big worship song that people are listening to that might be a good fit for us at Buck Run? 
And then that begins like the long process of kind of vetting music and, you know, we'll get into that later. But recently I went to Spotify and uh, I think I just searched like top worship songs or something like that. And I found a Spotify curated playlist and supposedly, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon hire Christians to categorize these things, to people who listen to Christian radio. The, of the first, I think it was the first five songs, one of them had a bridge that was lift, just a cover lifted from a secular song written into it, um, which again, nothing wrong with that just for like listening at home. You know, I listen to secular music, but like it was specifically like, it was presenting itself as congregational worship. Um, and then two of the top five artists are artists who have either fully deconstructed, to use that word, or have completely walked away from the faith. Um, and I was just struck by that. Like, if you just looked this person up, you would see that they no longer even believe the things that they are singing. Uh, a different artist um, had this very, very public uh, affair, and his new album now has like that mistress on the album cover with him, and it's just like, God has delivered us through the storm. Like, bro, you, you built that storm. <laughs> like, <come on. laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so my point is, uh, there is, and I don't think this is a problem here because you guys are sound and, uh, you know, we've sat under Herschel's teachings. But culturally at large, particularly in the United States, um, secularism has really infiltrated the worship music machine. And uh, it shows. It shows in the lyrics. It shows in the lifestyle of the artists. Um, and I think some of the seeds for that were planted, you know, 20 years ago. And now we're seeing the fruit of it. Um, artists that I used to love and really admire, songwriting icons in Christian music, uh, no longer identify as Christian at all, have completely walked away from the faith. And... You can see it if you go back. You can almost trace the breadcrumbs to where they are today. And so one of the things that we do in developing a theology of worship is we try to sniff out those breadcrumbs early, right? Like, we don't want to leave any room in the things that we sing, particularly that we're singing as a body of Christ. We don't want to leave any room um, for something that we say, like, that doesn't feel quite right. It's probably okay, because what doesn't feel quite right today, 10 years, 20 years down the road, may lead to something being completely away from the faith. Um, but these people are still cashing in, you know? Like, they'll still take the paycheck of their royalties from their Christian music. So uh, that's my side rant about the state of CCM. But to defend against bad theology is important. So we need to then uh, define worship. So I'm going to pull the room again. Uh, you don't have to give me a definition, but if you think, if you had to right now, do you think you would have a definition of worship? Like in your heart, in your mind, do you think you have a definition of worship? Raise your hand. Okay. So we're kind of like on the fence, like maybe a little bit. Let's read, uh, let's read some definitions here, and we'll kind of see why worship can actually be a little bit hard to define. But here's some great thinkers on the subject. I have no idea why I broke this up into so many lines. Okay, there we go. Jonathan Gibson, worship is the right, fitting, and delightful response of moral beings, angelic and human, to God the creator, redeemer, and consummator, for who he is as one eternal God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and for what he has done in creation and redemption, and for what he will do in the coming consummation, to whom be all praise and glory now and forever, world without end. Amen. I love that he just like threw a little worship in at the end of his, of his worship definition. That's great. I like that. All right, here is uh, Daniel Block, uh, pastor, or professor of Old Testament at Wheaton. He says, True worship involves reverential acts of homage and submission before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accord with his will. 
This multiple lines thing is killing me. All right, Bruce Leafblad. Worship is communion with God in which believers, by grace, center their minds, attention, and hearts' affection on the Lord, humbly glorifying God in response to his greatness and his word. You see this theme of responding that keeps coming up. Like, it's like we behold God and we respond in worship. John Piper, the inner essence of worship is to know God truly and then respond from the heart to that knowledge by valuing God, treasuring God, prizing God, enjoying God. That's Piper's kind of big thing, right? Enjoying God. Being satisfied with God above all earthly things. And then that deep, restful, joyful satisfaction in God overflows in demonstrable acts of praise from the lips and demonstrable acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. One thing I like about Piper's, uh, Piper's definition is he gets at um, kind of this twofold version of responding, right? That it's, it's verbal, it's from our lips, it's, act, it's, uh, it's praise and adoration, but it's also demonstrable acts of love uh, through service, um, so kind of going along with what Leaf Lab was saying about submission. Um, Bob Coughlin, Christian worship is a response of God's redeemed people to his self-revelation that exalts God's glory in Christ in our minds, affections, and wills in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I like that Bob kind of incorporates that all of worship hinges on uh, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Like, you can't do this. You cannot worship without the Holy Spirit. So, all of these definitions are great. Um, and I think they're all true. And, you know, they kind of hit at different things. Worship is a big thing, and it's hard to nail down to one paragraph. Uh, but one thing about all of those definitions is that they are all definitions of Christian worship, right? Right? All of those are explaining how we as Christians, uh, like we said in that key word of respond, how we respond to uh, the holiness of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, and we do so through uh, acts of service, acts of love, acts of praise. So that's all Christian worship. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Harold Best's definition of worship. Uh, Harold Best is a longtime uh, author, thinker, philosopher, um, and Christian leader in the world of worship theology. And uh, he has this helpful definition that I want us to focus on a little bit today because it's not specifically Christian worship. Uh, it's just worship that can be Christian or can be idolatry. So let's look at Harold Best. Um, um, okay, worship is the continuous outpouring of all that I am, all that I do, and all that I can ever become in light of a chosen or choosing God. Now again, this is not a definition of Christian worship. This is definition, this is zoomed out, right? This is a higher altitude definition of worship in general. That's why our G on God is lowercase, because this can be Christian worship, or it can be idolatry. And so we're going to look at a little bit of the mechanics of what, this, what Harold Bess is getting at here, of what continuous outpouring looks like. Um, has anyone heard this definition before? Heard of the idea of continuous outpouring? Great. All right, cool. We're, we're, we're starting fresh. That's good. That means you didn't watch my terrible online videos. <laughs> so we're doing good. All right, so continuous means relentless, ceaseless, faithful, outpouring, uh, flowing, lavish, generous. Um, continuous outpouring is, uh, it is community, it is love, it is affection, it is desire, it is acts of service, um, it is uh, fellowship. And so when God created us, um, I want you to think of us as kind of like, you know when you turn on a garden hose and you just hold it straight up in the air and the garden hose pressure's on, it's just bubbling over, right? That is kind of what 
humans are. We are continuously outpouring, uh, continuously bubbling over in worship. Um, the question is, is that worship directed rightly at a holy God, or is it directed at an idol? And so what Harold's getting at is that everyone worships. Uh, there isn't a soul alive today who is not worshiping this morning. You know, we use the terminology so often that we're like, yeah, I, I went to worship yesterday morning. Well, the reality is everyone alive on the planet is at worship in some way. Uh, he even breaks it down about how you can see uh, mirrored in secular culture mirrors of what has been established in uh, Christian churches for a long time. He talks about going to the temple of the mall. He says, think about uh, the average lost person that walks into a mall. They take this pilgrimage to their shopping center. They go in and they see the relics. They see the, uh, the symbols of their faith. And they uh, go to their priest behind the counter and they exchange their, their tithes and offerings and they receive the blessing. And it gives them a little bit of dopamine. It gives them a little bit of sense of joy and place and pleasure. And they have that community with other shoppers who are there. And then they go home. He said, everyone goes to church all the time. It just looks different for different people. Um, now this is not like an anti-shopping rant, so don't get mad at me. Uh, I love a good walk around the mall. Um, but let's break down a little bit about what this means to be continuous outpour. So the way that God has existed from time eternal, my artistry is like top-notch, so just get ready. You're going to love this. Um, so we've got God here, right? Um, let's do, here, I'm going to start over. Let's do, let's make the Trinity clear. I see, I already messed up. All right, I am not a fan of uh, illustrated attempts to explain the Trinity, but you guys are just going to bear with me here for a minute. You know, it's not a triangle, it's not an infinity symbol or anything, but let's just talk about, from time eternal, we had God, this is God, three persons, uh, distinct but the same, in fellowship with each other from time eternal. And in this fellowship, in this love, in this adoration among themselves, long before we were created, uh, was just this ongoing, continuous outpouring, this love and community together. Uh, God was not incomplete before man was made. God was complete and sufficient. He didn't need us. Uh, his continuous outpouring uh, was complete and sufficient here as God. Um, then, out of his mercy and out of his goodness and in his love, he created man. And he looked just like that, right? So, we have man. Now, there are um, two different kinds of continuous outpouring. This cord is going to kill me. Just a second. Um, there is God's continuous outpouring. God is unique and infinite. He has unique and infinite continuous outpouring, which comes across as lordship. Okay, so when God's love and his fellowship, his ministry to us pours out onto us, he is not worshiping us. It is his lordship over us because he is unique in that he is infinite. It is lordship. Uh, continuous outpouring unto creation. But man is unique and finite. You know, we, we breathe, we live, we die, um, we are temporary. It is our continuous outpouring back unto him is worship. So, before our relationship was broken in Genesis 3, God is continuous outpouring. You know, you think about... Uh, it's most clear in the early chapters of Genesis where you see God like walking in the garden with Adam and Eve, right? This fellowship uh, was unbroken. This love and community was tight-knit. Um, and in response was a continuous outpouring of love and relationship of worship 
back to God. So again, uh, this direction flowing down, lordship, and then flowing back up. Oh boy. Worship. Now in Genesis 3, all of this gets toppled, right? Um, so if you, again, if you think of us as kind of this bubbling hose, bubbling garden hose, before Genesis 3, it was like you kept your thumb on it and it was steered back at God, right? We kept it focused. Our relationship was on Christ. We had not yet, it was on with God. We had not yet sinned. Yahweh and creation were together in fellowship and community. Um, but what does uh, Satan do to deceive Eve? It's tempting her with other things, with distractions from that relationship with Christ. Or I keep saying with Christ, technically yes, but you know what I'm saying, with that relationship with God. Um, he tempts her with knowledge, with with wisdom that she doesn't have. Uh, he tempts her with this idea of uh, eternal life, and even though what he's offering her is death, and that uh, outpouring gets broken, and suddenly there's idols in her life, right? I want to be as wise as God. And it's a, it's a selfish lifting up of yourself and pretending for a moment that maybe you are the unique infinite. You know, maybe I can know all good and evil. Uh, and so that relationship is broken. So where we are now is that we have... So God up here is creator. And our continuous outpouring in just as we exist today from birth is no longer aimed at God, but we worship creation. Um, most, if you just caught a random person on the street and just asked them, uh, do you believe in Christ? No. So you worship creation? No. I don't, <laughs> I don't worship creation. Uh, but the truth is they do. They just don't know that they do. Some people are blatant about it, right? There are like actual cults in witchcraft where they make it very clear that they worship and they break it down into like trees and the environment and they worship creation. Uh, but worshiping creation doesn't necessarily mean like tree huggers. It means anything that is not God. Anything, because God created all things, but if it is not God, it is idolatry. Um, so that relationship is broken and uh, we begin to worship creation. Let's look at uh, an example of this in Scripture. If you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And then we'll look at verse 11 and read through to the end of chapter 8. It's so Deuteronomy 8, verse 11. This is God warning people of Israel to remember the Lord. He says, Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commands, ordinances, and statutes that I am giving you today. When you eat and are full and build houses, um, and build beautiful houses to live in, and your herds and flocks grow large. And your silver and gold multiply, and everything you have increases. Be careful that your heart doesn't become proud, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with all its poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of the flint of the rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers had not known, in order to humble and test you, so that in the end 
he might cause you to prosper. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability has gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant he swore to your fathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, to serve them and bow and worship to them, I testify against you today that you will perish Like the nations the Lord is about to destroy before you, you will perish if you do not obey the Lord your God. So in this passage, God is clearly spelling out to them. He's like, remember what I have done for you. Remember that I led you out of the wilderness, that I gave you water from the flint of the rock. These are not your God. Your your herds of cattle, your gold and silver, your beautiful houses— that when we focus on those, we are forgetting the Lord our God. Our relationship is broken. Our worship is broken. Um, So that's that's what he's talking about. He's painting this picture of us, of God continuously outpouring unto his people, the chosen people of Israel, and them continuously out, warning against them, continuously outpouring unto the things that, that he has given them, turning around these blessings and making them his idols. And if we're honest, we all see this to some degree in our own lives, right? I mean, uh, I don't think any of us have like hills of cattle, but, uh, or like chambers full of gold and silver, but like we get comfortable. Um, you know, we live in the most comfortable nation in the world, um, and that becomes more and more clear every day. Uh, and so it's easy for us to make idols out of the things that make us comfortable. And not idols that are completely derailing our faith. We're not walking away from the faith, but they are a hindrance to our relationship with God. They are uh, a breaking off of this uh, spout, this fountain that is supposed to flow back to God in worship. So what did Christ do to fix this? Uh, Christ was unique in that he was fully God and fully man at the same time. So he had continuous outpouring of worship unto the creator, God, and he had continuous outpouring of lordship unto creation, man. And in so doing, because he lived a sinless life, uh, he never once stumbled, he never once gave in to temptation, he never once, uh, his, his gaze was forever fixed upon uh, his God the Father and his will for his life. He demonstrated perfect worship. He demonstrated the perfection of God's design. He executed what we could not execute in ourselves. We'll get to the Q&A later. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens when I can't see the slides coming up next. Um, so that is kind of the the general, the broad, high elevation uh, picture of what worship looks like. It is uh, ongoing, and it is existing in all of us, and what we aim to do as Christians is to rightly aim our worship to the only one who deserves our worship, uh, to the person who created us to worship him. Um, and that's one thing, by the way, if you read uh, Harold Best's book, which I recommend you do, it's called, um, it's called Unceasing Worship, and I could not find my copy of it today, but he has another book here that we'll also talk about, uh, Music Through the Eyes of Faith, which I would also recommend. Um, but Harold Best is even careful to, to, he doesn't use the phrase created for worship or created to worship. Um, because he's, he's afraid that it might make it sound like God was incomplete before we were created, and he doesn't want that to come across. So you may hear me say that. Uh, that's certainly not what I am intending if I say that we were created to worship. What I mean is that uh, by design, intrinsic with our creation, intrinsic with our design, is that we are to worship God, uh, and that we will worship something uh, if we don't worship God. Any question? I know this is kind of like, a lot, and uh, we're cramming it in a short period of time. Any questions about this before we move on? Context, 
You know that's going to be hard for me, Molly. Uh, There it is. Bam. Well, I got to go line by line. Yeah, so worship is the continuous outpouring of all that I am, all that I do, and all that I can ever become in light of a chosen or choosing God. All right, well, let's look at, um, let's look at some specifics then of Christian worship. Okay, uh, can someone jump to uh, Acts, book of Acts, chapter 17? Here, I'm going to give us a couple references, and then I'll, if I can just have a few of you look these up for us. So the first one we'll look at, Acts 17, 24 to 31. Then we'll do, uh, if someone could grab Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And then we need Philippians 3, 3. And Psalm 95, 6. And then someone grab Romans 12, 1 through 2. All right, who has uh, Acts 17, 24 to 31? Anybody want to read that for us? Awesome. Thank you. So the first thing that we get uh, from this passage about Christian worship is that it is initiated by God. It begins with that continuous outpouring onto us, right? That he... We cannot, uh, on our own fruition, just up and decide to worship God without God uh, initiating it. Um, Where it says, um, Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. Um, Again, it's back to this idea that God is not incomplete without our worship and that our Christian worship is initiated by him. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And this day shall reign on the earth. Okay, so quick quiz. What's the current hymn that is written on that verse that we sing here? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so, uh, it's made possible through Christ. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Uh, only Christ. So, worship is initiated by God, but it's still impossible without uh, someone completing that impossible task of that sinless life, that continuous outpouring, that lordship and worship just demonstrated perfectly. Uh, who is worthy to open the scroll? Uh, only Christ. Only Christ has made it possible for us. Um, Philippians 3.3. 3. Worship God in spirit. So our Christian worship is empowered by the spirit. Uh, it gets back to that Definition by Coughlin. Let me see if I can find that one. Christian worship is the response of God's redeemed people to his self-revelation that exalts God's glory in Christ in our minds, affections, and wills in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what Philippians is saying to us, right? That's what Paul's writing here is that uh, we cannot do this without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Um, 
And then the last two, um, Psalm 95, 6. So bowing, kneeling, uh, and then Romans 12, 1 through 2. So these are both passages explaining to us that our worship then is fulfilled in submission. So remember, we talked about everyone worships, everyone's doing this all the time. This is not attractive to someone apart from Christ. Um the temptations of the world, the temptations of the other idols is that they are self-initiated. Um, you make them possible. You empower it. And you feel most fulfilled in your own uh, version of lordship, your own idea of lordship. It's the exact opposite of everything that, that God has painted out for us to believe worship is. Um, You know, gosh, you see this so much, and I feel like it just gets more and more obvious all the time. But like the, even like the rise and grind type of like self-motivational Instagrams are always the exact opposite of this, right? It's about how you can do this you are made for this. You can overcome these things. And look, I am not like, I do not want you to go around like giving yourself like lashes and, you know, beating yourself up and having low self-esteem. That's not what I'm advocating for. But what I'm advocating for is that our heart, our aspirations are rightly ordered so that we know that, that yes, God has made us and that he has empowered us to do so many awesome things. And if you're having trouble like getting up at eight o'clock in the morning to go to work. Like you don't need a rise and grind Instagram. You just need like a better alarm clock. Okay. Like it's, it, that it's, it's all just selling things to you. Uh, but that what we believe as Christians is that uh, when we come to worship, we, we know that our worship is initiated by God. We are only here in this room right now because God initiated it in our hearts uh, when he called us to himself. And we know that we can only approach the throne of grace through Christ, right? Um, how does, uh, let's do another poll again. How many of you think you might have sinned this week leading up to you? <laughs> Great, good, cool. None of you are psychos. All right. <laughs> we all sinned this week at some point, and yet we're still here. How are we here in the house of the Lord? How are we here to approach the holy of holies? What gives us the right It's nothing that we have done, but we are dressed in the righteousness of Christ. That perfect life, all of those things he accomplished, he has has clothed us in that righteousness so that we can draw near with confidence, as Paul says, to the throne of grace. We don't approach a holy God uh, with the fear of judgment. We approach a holy God with fear and awe, right? Uh, So that's made possible through Christ. And it's empowered by the Spirit. Um, We know that the Spirit is with us. He is communicating to us. He is empowering us, enabling us uh, to do the things that we need to do in worship. Um, And it is fulfilled in submission. That is the most countercultural part of it all. Uh, Submitting to anyone is, is just... It's not on the to-do list of the secular world. Um, There is so much propaganda right now about um, just about having like a lack of authority in your life. And, um, you know, Seth York even talks about this. He has a a class that he's taught before on, um, you know, at crossings. He's every year he's bringing in. Uh, 18 year olds to like work at his camp and so he has a lot of experience in leading young people and just seeing that like yeah this every year the generation becomes more and more independent less reliant on authority and 
it's not to say that they're bad kids, they're great kids, but it's just understanding who they are based on what culture is training them to be. And uh, that's important for us to remember too in how we interact with our brothers and sisters and how we see and filter out the things that we allow into our homes through culture. Um, that submission to Christ is, uh, it is blasphemy in the worship of the world. It is uh, unacceptable. Because if you submit to Christ, then you uh, cast aside idols of gender fluidity and um, you know the new sexual ethics and uh, just everything. All of that stuff has to go away if you are truly submitted to Christ. And those are concrete idols that they do not want you to touch. So it's countercultural stuff, Christian worship, but it's been countercultural. Uh, from the beginning of time. Uh, it's not new that this is anti-populism like this. The, the Roman government also had a problem with Christian worship, if you couldn't pick that up from Acts and other places. So uh, we have the saints who have gone before us, who have endured these trials and have overcome, and we know that um, part of being empowered by the Spirit is that we will be empowered to overcome those those struggles, and even though uh, it may, uh, I don't think any of us are facing execution right now, but it, even in parts of the world where that is happening, that is not a loss. There is still victory in every martyr, in every saint who dies submitted to Christ. Um, so that is the, the perils of, of Christian worship. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Christian worship and music. Any questions about this before we go on? Come on, y'all. You're just as interactive as that robot camera I had last year. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but someone did say they were bringing me coffee, so. Oh. Like, come and get it. <laughs> Um, okay, Christian worship and music. Why do we think of music when we think about worship? Now you have to answer. I'm just directly asking you a question. Right, yeah. Yeah, singing has been a tradition of worship uh, from the beginning. So... Mm-hmm. It wasn't by accident that music has that effect on us. I think that we're programmed that way. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, we tend to think of music, I think, mostly, well, first of all, we, let's just say from the beginning, worship is not only music, right? And I think we all know that on an intellectual level, but in our terminology, it still comes out that it's music. I do this all the time. I am the worship pastor at Buck Run. Does that mean that I do all of the preaching and all of the scripture reading and all of the lamenting? Like, does that mean I do all of that? No, I just lead the music, (laughs) right? So even in our own terminology, it's built in. Uh, And part of that Again, it's not because that's what our doctrine of worship is here. It's just that's our cultural norm. Uh, That's the way that we are trained to communicate it. Um, But worship is so much more than just music. So why do we associate it with music most of all? Um, For one, it's because we have an emotional connection with music, right? Um. We have emotional connections with other things, but the way that God designed us, like you said, is that music is powerful. Uh, God designed music to be powerful, to stir the emotions. Um, the tricky thing about Christian music is, it, it, is that all music is Christian music, right? Like, just as God created all things, all music is meant to glorify God, and when it doesn't, then that's where we have the rub. But um, 
There is no arrangement of notes and harmonies that cannot be used to glorify God because he built it. It's, it's the math that he designed, that he wove into creation. Um, so when we have that emotional response, um, we can translate that emotion into a, a type of communication that we feel with the divine, right? And I think that's real, and I think it's good that our spirits get stirred by our, uh, the music that we sing in that, you know, uh, when Chris is reading scripture, you know, every Sunday we do a song, a welcome, two songs, and then a scripture reading. And when Chris is reading scripture, it's not often that you see someone like doing this, like while he's reading the scripture, unless Damika's here. Like Damika's got it. She gets it. But the rest of us... You know, that doesn't happen as often. Part of that is because, you know, Chris can't sing. And so, <laughs> but no, um, but just the reading of Scripture doesn't stir the emotions at, at the surface level quite the same way that chords and melody and, and a well-crafted song do. And that's okay. That's not a slight against Scripture. Obviously, we can live without worship music. We cannot live without scripture, right? If we, if we had to pick one or the other, we're going Bible every time, okay? Like if the power goes out and I can't get any sound to come out of the speakers, we still have church. If I lose my voice, we still have church and it's still fulfilling because that's not what our service hinges on. Um, but it's, it's normal that our emotional responses are triggered by music. And so we tend to kind of, our synapses make that connection, right? And so we think like worship, I felt amazing. There was a big rush of dopamine in that chorus. They really hit that bridge. That's worship. That's part of it. Secondly is um, we live in a culture that likes to make money, and we have created a genre out of worship, Right? And again, this is not uh, a slam on the worship genre. I'm recording a worship album right now, and I'm going to release it as a worship album in the genre, and that's going to benefit me. So I'm not slamming worship music as a genre, but you just need to understand that that is a genre that exists. Uh, when you go onto Spotify, you can type in worship, and you're not going to get responsive readings. You're not going to get prayers. You're not going to get... Uh, the laments of David, you're going to get Hillsong, for better or for worse. That's what we associate with worship. It's a multi-million dollar industry. Uh, I will not be making multi-millions of dollars, don't worry. <laughs> but some people are. And uh, it's, it's hard for us to kind of shift gears and to get out of that mindset. Now again, hear me say very clearly, nothing wrong with worship music, nothing wrong with us associating that. I just want to make sure that we go into every service knowing that um, everything that we're doing in there is worship. When we are listening to the Word of God being read, when we are sitting under the faithful preaching of the Word of God, um, we have one of the best preachers in the SBC. You know what I mean? Like, we just, we are so spoiled here. Um, Herschel is just the champ, and he does such a great job, and I want us to sit under that preaching knowing that like, because he is so focused on uh, just presenting the word of God as it is, that that is such a great opportunity for us to worship, to receive that word and um, to respond in prayer. Um, I hope that as you're taking notes, when you're listening to the sermon, that you're also praying. You know, just, it doesn't mean like for each note, like, dear Lord, thank you that all worshipers by design. You know, like, the, I just mean, like, just as you go, just thank the Lord. Give him the same adoration and praise that you give him when we sing 10,000 Reasons that you do uh, as you're listening to the sermon. Um, praise him for the clear communication of his word. Um, but all that to say, worship is more than music, but we must still have music. Because like you said, it is written into our DNA. Um, it has been uh, spelled out for us from the beginning. We see examples of it. That, that song of Moses is one of my favorite passages to use for a call to worship because it's just so beautiful. Um, so singing 
music has been uh, part of our Christian tradition um, since the Old Testament. So let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual song, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So when we, when we sing, when we have that gratitude, that is, that is still worship. It is not... Less, it is not more than that, but it's not less than that. It is commanded to us that we sing. Uh, throughout the Psalms, how often do you hear the command, sing a new song to the Lord? Play skillfully on the harp and the lyre. Um, we don't have any harps or lyres, but we still try to play skillfully on what we've got, and I think that fits. Um, but So music is still woven through Scripture as part of our... Um, response to God. Uh, the psalmist really provides uh, a blueprint for us through um, his writings of what it looks like to sing. So we'll break that down a little bit more next week. Um, we'll start to tackle some of the uh, controversies over music, over style, and uh, I, w- I want to, through this course, be extremely transparent with you about where I'm at on everything that makes people mad about worship, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so whatever is the hot button issue that you've got, um, I promise you I've probably thought about it, I've probably wrestled with it, and we probably have a formulated biblical response to it. Um, and you may be thinking, like, I didn't know that there was anything that people were mad about at worship. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> Stay off Twitter. Like, just don't even get on it. Um, because we don't want to exist as a church that is um, hiding, you know, our, our thinking behind the choices that we make. The most important thing that our church does happens in that room uh, at 1045 every week. It is the most important thing that we do. It is the gathered body of Christ worshiping together. And again, it is every aspect of what we do in there. It's not just the singing. Um, so I want you to be put at ease that everything that we do in there has a reason. There is thought and uh, theology put into all of those decisions. And uh, like I said, we're, we don't make those decisions to fill seats. Um, there are things that we could be doing um, that could pack this place out within a year of doing it. And we don't do them for reasons. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be the worship leader if that was the case. There are others that we could find that could do those things better. Um, But we have really intentional ways of doing things because we want to guide you through a biblical order of worship um, that edifies you, that encourages you, gives you space to lament, gives you space to mourn, gives you space to confess, to repent, to see and behold the sufficiency of the gospel, and to respond to that in praise. Um, So we'll talk about liturgy, we'll talk about song selection, we'll talk about um, styles of worship, why we sound the way that we sound, things like that. Um, So I just want to encourage you to come prepared with questions. Um, If you have Uh, Again, if you have any of those hot-button issues that you're curious about, um, don't be afraid to raise those questions. Uh, I can't guarantee you'll love my answers, but I will at least be 100% honest with you on why we stand where we stand and why we make the decisions we do.